objectives of our report is the discussion about the contemporary global governance, identify the institutions, goals, effects of global governance, identify the challenges of contemporary global governance. Contemporary global governance is a movement toward political integration of transnational actors aim at negotiating and responses to problems that affect more than one state or region. It tends to involve institutionalization, this institution of global governance, the United Nations, the International Criminal Court, the World Bank, and others tend to have limited and demarcated power to enforce compliance. The modern question of world governance exists in the context of globalization and globalizing regimes of power, politically, economically, and culturally in response to the acceleration of interdependence on a worldwide scale, both bet between human societies and between humankind. In the biosphere, the term global governance may also be used to name the process of designating laws, rules, and regulation intended, intended for a global scale, while international non-governmental organizations are also known as INGO, international not-for-profit organization performing public function, but not established or run by nation. State the first modern INGO are traceable to the 19th century. The International Red Cross was founded in Switzerland in 1865, but they have boomed in recent years, turning point in the history of INGOs occurred in 1992 when. Treaty to control the emission of greenhouse gases was signed as a result of action of a variety group that not only extended external pressure but were actually involved in the decision making process international treaty spearheaded by international campaign to ban land mines or also known as ICBL. The treaty was designed in 19 97 by 122 nations which agreed to stop selling and using landmines. Thank you. Institution of Contemporary Global Governance History of United Nations The United Nations became a thing in 1945 just to stop the Second War. The big ally for wanted to prevent another huge war to never happen again. In 1945, 850 representatives from 50 countries met, and the results of this, it's already binding the contract between all the countries, including like is to maintain international peace and security. For example of this, when the United Nations and Security Council took actions with the North Korea's nuclear missile activities with eight functions of resolutions in order to maintain peace and security. Next, developing friendly relations among nations, for example of this, is for every time they have conventions to strengthen peace among nations. Next, promoting social progress. Their, their projects to delivered monetary foods for people that hunger, sick, and etc. Next, harmonizing the actions of nations. An example of this is could when the United Nations mobilize a global fight against COVID-19. Last, human rights. An example of this is when the United Nations is when they launch a comprehension review on the Philippines drug war, nowadays, the United Nations consists of 193 countries. It is managed by the United Nations Security Council, which is made up by five countries, including France, Britain, United States, Russia, and China.
The United Nations now has a bunch of specialist agency like World Health Organization and UNICEF, which help to improve the lives of kids for the better and deeper information. Let's watch the video. President Truman arrives to attend the last session of the conference to mark its official closing, the day which the whole civilized world has awaited anxiously that it might judge results. And the world, as well as San Francisco, rejoices over great progress made. At the Opera House, last hours of the convention as delegates of the steering committee honor Edward Stutinius, who later resigned as Secretary of State to become permanent chairman of the American delegation. And Lord Halifax calls dramatically for a standing vote on the completed charter. And it is now my duty, my honor and my privilege in the chair to call for a vote on the approval of the charter of the United Nations Nation by nation, the delegates stand up for the great new charter they hammered out together. Fifty nations standing side by side, unanimous for peace. Now, final signing of the charter. China signing first as the first nation attacked in this war. Dr. Wellington Koo's signature topping the long list to come. Then for Russia, Ambassador Gromyko commits his country also to the agreements and objectives decided upon after days and nights of compromise and cooperation. Four main agencies upon which the world now puts its hope. A powerful Security Council having final military authority. A General Assembly representing all member nations. A Social and Economic Council to tackle the causes of war. And an International Court to judge any international disputes. The signing is done. The Great Charter is completed. This draft of mankind's deepest hopes already a historic document. Perhaps the Magna Carta of peace-loving humanity itself. Now Statinius introduces the final speaker of the San Francisco Convention. The President of the United States of America. If we had had this charter a few years ago, and above all, the will to use it, millions now dead would be alive. If we should falter in the future in our will to use it, millions now living will surely die. Now there's a time for making plans, and there's a time for action. The time for action is here now. Today, the Allied world salutes these representatives of 50 nations. They have made a beginning, a brave beginning, that can build a mighty structure for peace. Out of a world of agony and total war has come a charter that must mark a turning point in human history. A new way lies ahead. The world must take this way, through unity and cooperation, to a lasting peace. What is United Nations? United Nations does not directly bring together the people of the world, but sovereign nation states, and like what I've said earlier, there are 193 contest members who make recommendations through the UN General Assembly. The UN mandate is to preserve global security, which is thus particularly through the security. In addition, the UN can settle international legal issues through the International Court of Justice and implement its key decisions through the Secretariat led by the Secretary General. Six Organs of United Nations Organs of Organization The General Assembly The Security Council The Economic and Social Council The Trusteeship Council International Court of Justice The Secretary
the General Assembly. The General Assembly is the central deliberative and the only organ where all member states have equal representation in discussion and consideration and policy making. Security Council. The Security Council is the organ which has the commitment to preserve peace and security. The Economic and Social Council. The Economic and Social Council is the main organ for cooperation, policy review, policy dialogue, and advice on social, economic, and environmental issues. The Trusteeship Council. The Trusteeship Council is the organ tasked to administer international oversight for 11 terrorists and to make sure that adequate procedures are taken for independence and self-government. The International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. The court is charged with settling legal disputes between states and giving advisory opinions to the United Nations and the specialized agencies. The Secretariat. The Secretariat services the other principal organs of the United Nations and administers the program and policies established by them. In 2015, the United Nations turned 70. Since World War II, the UN has existed to foster communication between its member states to achieve global goals, which would be impossible individually. So how do they do this? How exactly does the UN work? Well, the UN is divided into six main parts. The first is the General Assembly, which includes nearly all internationally recognized countries, making up 193 member states. The Assembly meets annually in September and debates issues on security and diplomacy. In 2015, the major topic is climate change and helping developing countries face the threat of global warming. Within the General Assembly, resolutions relating to defense as well as administrative issues like new membership and budget require a two-thirds vote. Most other issues only need a majority. Every country, regardless of size, gets a single vote. However, there are two states in the UN which are not actual members. The Vatican, whose government is called the Holy See, and Palestine. These are called permanent non-member observer states, and while they can't vote, they are allowed to take part in debates. The second arm of the UN is the Security Council. It exists to prevent conflict on a large scale, promoting peace through diplomacy or sanctions. It only has five permanent members, Russia, France, China, the UK, and the US, which were all winning powers in World War II. The permanent members have veto power, and their use has been incredibly controversial. The US, for example, has vetoed dozens of resolutions against Israel for their actions in the Middle East. There are 10 more members representing Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and Western Europe. Those 10 are elected on a rolling basis every two years to make sure that major world regions have representation. The Security Council's resolutions are carried out by the UN's peacekeeping force, which boasts about 100,000 soldiers. One of the most important parts of the UN is the Economic and Social Council, which works to improve standards of living and promote human rights. Most of what the UN actually does is centered around helping developing countries. The Council works with specialized agencies like the World Health Organization and High Commission for Refugees to make that happen. The judicial arm of the UN is the International Court of Justice. This is where international law violations are debated and prosecuted, although countries with significant power can often refuse to comply with their decisions. The fifth arm of the UN is actually not operational. The Trusteeship Council was created in the 1940s to help developing territories and dependencies become independent countries. The council was suspended in 1994 after helping more than 70 countries gain independence. And finally, the Secretariat is essentially the internal administrative workings of the UN. They're the ones who compile reports, communicate between the different councils, and are headed by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Although the UN exists to promote global cooperation, many have criticized the greater influence of the five permanent Security Council members. Still, the UN has seen incredible advancement in fighting hunger, poverty, and child mortality. Without communication and cooperation, the world would be considerably worse. Want to get a deep dive into why the UN Security Council has five permanent members? Check out Secret Daily's video to find out more. So if the 15-member council passes a substantive resolution, all 193 members are obliged to follow through. As you can imagine, member states at large do not always agree with the council, which has led to some instances of dissent. Thanks for watching Test Tube News. Make sure to like and subscribe for new videos every day. World Bank is a provider of financial and technical assistance to individual countries and around the world.
They both consider itself a unique financing institution that set up partnership to reduce poverty and support economic development. The World Bank supplies qualifying governments with low interest loans, zero interest credits, and grants, all to support the development of individual economies. The borrowing, borrowings and cash infusion help with global education, healthcare, public administration, infrastructure, and private sectors. The World Bank also shares information with various entities through policy advice, research and analysis, analyze, analysis and technical assistance. It offers advice and trainings for both the public and the private sectors. World Bank. World Bank is an international organization that provides financing ad advice and research to developing nations to help advance their economies. World Bank and International Monetary Fund, or IMF, founded simultaneously under the Bretton Woods Agreement, both seek to serve international governments. The World Bank has expanded to become known as the World Bank Group with five cooperative organizations, sometimes known as the World Banks. The World Bank Group offers a multitude of proprietary financing assistance products and solution for international governments as well as a range of research based through leadership for the global economy at large. The World Bank Humans Capital Pro Project seeks to help nation invest in, in and develop their human capital to pro produce a better society and economy. International Criminal Court the ICC's primary mission is to serve as a court of last resort capable of prosecuting individuals for genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes. When national jurisdictions are unable or unavailable to do so for any reason, for example, alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in the context of conflict in CAR since July 1, 2002, with a peak of violence in 2002 and 2003. The Presidency It has been a privilege to work with her during her presidency. Judicial Division The decision rendered by the court with respect to individual cases, except decision by the Region, City, and People's Court, the Military Tribunal, the Court Presidia, and the Plan of the Court, originate in the Judicial Division of the Appropriate Court. The Office of Prosecutor is an independent organ of the Court. It is responsible for examining situation under the jurisdiction of the Court where genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and aggression appear to have been committed or carrying out investigation and prosecuting against the individual who are alleged most responsible for those crimes. The Registry A place where official reports are kept, a book or system for keeping on official list of record of items. Good day everyone, my name is Roxanne Pornell from USCS 20 Responsibles in Global Governance. The leading institution in the charge of global lands today is the United Nations. United Nations, founded in 1945 in the wake of Second World War, it is an intergovernment organization that aims to maintain international peace, security, developing friendly relationship among nations, and promoting social progress, better living standard, and human rights. Other institutions with a global mandate are the Britson World Institutions, which consists of the World Bank, International Monetary Funds. The primary actors of the global governance is states and intergovernmental organization, market forces, civil society actors, multi-stakeholders, States and Intergovernmental Organization is an organization composed primarily, primarily of sovereign states, 
or of other organization through formal triatres for handling, serving, common interest, and governed by international law. Market forces, the action of buyers and sellers that cause the prices of goods and services to change without being controlled by the government. The economic forces of supply and demand the value of these commodities is determined by the market forces. Civil Society Actors The development of civil society capacity is a mainstay of Natural Resources Governance Institute works. We provide financial and technical support and trainings to civil society organizations in all of our priorities, countries, and also to global level initiatives. Multi-stakeholder institute, an emergent element of the discourse surrounding global governance institutions attempt to bridge the gap between these old and new forms of actors, namely private interest, state actors, and transnational civil society. It is a con contested subject. Different actors perceive this multi stakeholders institutions in different ways this transformation in global governance is designed to make governance process more effective and more legitimate but can it do both at the same time some of the effect of globalization in global governance includes power reduction human rights violation trade and investment inequities and disputes occurrence of civil conflict Increased job and expanded infrastructure benefits some countries. Power reduction. Many people argue that redefining in terms of purchasing power will increase the voting rate of developing countries. Human rights violation. Human beings seldom able to enjoy the full extent of their rights. The implementation of human rights is served as the global governance. Followed by trade and investment, inequities and, and disputes. Trading investment disputes, the failure of commodity, children society concerns about the over-independence and commodity experts following related crisis. Theorems of civil conflict. The ANS minor rules of recent international security murders has prompted calls from our legitimacy for Security Council and lastly trending investment dispute the failure of commodity occurrences heightened concern about the over independent and commodity expert fall in related prices. Increased job and expanded infrastructure benefits some countries. State investment in transportation, public buildings, and water treatment system and other form of vital infrastructure is key to creating good jobs and promoting full economic recovery. The condition roads, bridge, school, water treatment plants, and other physical assets greatly influences the economic's ability to function and grow. Commerce requires will maintain roads, railroads, airports, and ports so the manufacturers can obtain raw materials and part and deliver finished product to consumer.
guys, good morning. This is me, Kate Alvindo, and today we're going to talk about the effects of globalization to the government. internationally recognized an independent state, we have a population, common language, defined territory, and as established government. Now, the state has four elements. Number one, well, it has a population, obviously, because this population refers to the people that compose the state. How can you even call a state if it doesn't have a people, right? Number two, territory. Territory refers to the place where the people are located, including the land, natural resources, and airspace located within it. So it also refers to the geographic region of an area. Number three, well, the government. The system that administers or controls the state, instrument through which the will of the state is made known and implemented. Number four. Well, sovereignty, the last one, refers to the ability of the state to govern itself without outside influence or interference. Well, each state has its own right to self-determination and that the other country should not intervene in the affairs of the state unless there are extraordinary reasons to do so. Okay. Alright, so other countries must recognize sovereignty or the right to govern not to own territorial borders. Each state is autonomous unto itself and responsible with its own system of government to those who are governed. Alright, so the decisions to conflict and the resolution of that conflict are done through the institution of government established and codified in a particular state, whether or not through elections. Alright, so elections, especially in a democratic society. For example, here in Philippines, so we, we are doing elections to vote for our president, the vice president, down to the lowest hierarchy of the government. This is because to provide the, state, the leadership of the state. In addition, the policy is developed and implemented in the interest of the people of a state by a specific government. Alright, so a civil society in a state can also act as a counterweight or a supplement to government. So civil society includes private economy, educational institutions, churches, hospitals, fraternal organizations, and other nonprofit organizations. Well, actually, there are many, or I mean several, challenges to the government and ultimately to the state economy. We can divide these challenges into four. What are these? These are traditional challenges, challenges from national or identity movements, Number three is global economics, and fourth is the global social movements, which will be tackled for the next video. So, tune in. Alright, so that's it. I hope you learned something from my discussion, and thank you as well for listening. So, I hope um, this would continue with the next reporter as they go on to the next topics. And uh, have a nice day, everybody. Let's proceed to the goals of contemporary global governance. What are those? First, is to provide public goods, to have peace and security, to justice mediation system, for functioning markets, to undefined standards for trade. Provide public goods, to make this the benefit all members of the society and which provided for free through public taxation. Peace and security. Since the UN creation on 24 October 1945, the United Nations has often been called 
a fund to prevent disputes from escalating into war, or to help restore peace following the outbreak of armed conflict, and to promote lasting peace in societies emerging from war. Justice mediation system, form of alternative dispute resolution resolving disputes between two or more parties with concrete effects. Function markets unified. No firm has the power to dominate the market. Unified standards for trends. Read compliance describe the process and procedures by which goods enter and exit a country and adhere to in laws, rules, regulations, and requirements of the country from which the goods are being imported or exported. The challenges of contemporary global governance environmental, climate change, growing population, pandemic. In fact, with the contemporary times come contemporary challenges that do not only need to be addressed, but also have to be solved as soon as we can. Now, these challenges pertain to different social, environmental, and economic problems that different countries suffer, suffer from. Of course, solutions are always led by the authorities, especially the government. But what exactly are these global challenges and how do the government act on this more factories mean more waste extracted on waters and air and even land? Hence, with such damage come the fluctuation of high temperature with the global causing climate change. Moreover, population are growing to sometimes such damage amount of people cause shortage in resource within the local, local causing different concerns among the affected ones sometimes sometimes leading to health issues among the weak or conflict among two or more places places groups of people may also fight for this resource for survival causing conflict among those involved at worst cases tourism of course the rise of economic intent dependence among developed and developing countries has led to very negative consequences, especially with the regards to the environment, more factories mean more wasted extracted on waters, air, and even land. Now, this another problem being faced by the human race today. Is it is another problem that is a getaway from more global concerns. Such issues can sometimes cause food and water Insecurity since many people are consuming the same will planet action. Get done effective, effectively and efficiently resulting on even better future for each and every nation. In September 2015, the United Nations launched their 15-year plan to make the world a better place. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals are focused on improvement and longevity and are a focal point of UN Week in New York City. Additionally, a number of summits provide the opportunity for world leaders to cooperate in achieving these global goals. So what exactly are the world's biggest problems? Well, first and foremost, poverty is an inescapable issue for nearly all developing countries. Roughly one in seven people around the world live on less than $1.25 a day, and nearly half of the global population lives on just $2.50. While about a third of the world's poor are located in India, only 10 countries house 80% of the poorest people on Earth. Closely tied to poverty is the issue of hunger. Inadequate nutrition contributes to nearly half of all child deaths worldwide. And in regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, one in four people are malnourished. As a result, nearly 800 million people don't have access to enough food to live healthy, active lives. Similarly, water and sanitation are absolute necessities. Yet nearly the same number of people without access to food lack access to water. And a third of the world's population risks disease by not having adequate sanitation. Another major issue for developing countries is a lack of educational opportunities. The UN predicted in 2011 that if all students had even basic reading skills, world poverty could be reduced by more than 10%. But illiteracy is an asymmetrical problem and affects considerably more women than men. 
of roughly 780 million illiterate adults worldwide, two-thirds are female. As a result, women have considerably fewer opportunities, and it hurts a country's ability to progress economically without a fully educated workforce. This inequality is rampant and not exclusively relegated to gender. Economic inequality is also drawn along racial and social divides. Countries like Namibia see only a few thousand white landowners owning almost half of the country's agricultural land for a population of more than two million. In fact, land distribution has become an increasingly relevant issue. With man-made climate change, deforestation, and overfishing, the rapid environmental decline might be too late to reverse. Although organizations like the UN have implemented standards and worked to save forests, oceans, and the atmosphere, it continues to be a serious issue for the international community. The UN Summit's 17 global goals span from micro to macro and hope to contribute to solutions for the world's biggest problems. Through communication, training, and financial support, it's up to influential world leaders and average citizens to seek to improve the world. Since addressing issues like poverty and hunger, most countries have made considerable progress on every set goal. So we know that the United Nations has been effective working on these issues, but how effective has it been? Find out in our video. The United Nations emerged after World War II with the objective of achieving a global balance of peace between world powers. Today, they have 193 member states, and they have roughly 100,000 soldiers or Blue Berets operating 16 separate peacekeeping missions around the globe. Thanks for Examples of contemporary global governance. Financial market regulation through the bank international settlement. Guideline for multinational enterprise set by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development.